a spectacular event called the Amato Con, the three-day executive development program. Like Christmas here at Amato Con, mints. It will feature the biggest names in the business. Look at that. Riverside for it. She was here about 20 minutes ago. Entertainment. It's the map of the baboon. And education. The letter G has won 12 Oscars. My son, Tiamato, will be providing a keynote address. I have the wrong, we have the wrong file on this. Can I take five minutes, uh, please? Join us March 8, 9, and 10th in Rialto, California. Where's my Rialto folks out there? And I will personally be delivering an unforgettable lecture on the power of mercy. Unlock your potential. I believe in the power of mercy. Do you? Amatocon was just a couple of months ago, and let me tell you, it's changed my life. I used to be a real piece of shit, a real garbage kind of guy. But now with the help of T. Amato, my potential has been fully unlocked. I'm rich as a goddamn billionaire now. Sorry I'm late on this one, but with all I've learned, I've been super busy running several businesses, helping my community, and directing award-winning films. In reality, the unsettling memory of the 11th annual On Cinema Oscar special live from Amatocon has been stuck in my head more firmly than the chorus of Ride With The Devil. I took a ride with a devil. While I don't think this is anywhere near the funniest Oscar special per se, it's perhaps the weirdest, the saddest, the most affecting in a strange way. I definitely wouldn't suggest a newbie start here for a good representation of the show at large, but for a longtime avid viewer borderline obsessed with this universe, I'm so glad this exists in the way that it does. Because beyond being a great addition to this already incredibly complex universe and its story that feels like something both familiar and creatively ambitious, it has a really strong artistic quality to it. Where I think this Oscar special excels more than any other is in its tone and atmosphere. The visual design with the amazing set, lightings, and graphics, the tension between almost every pair of characters you could choose, the looming mystery, the costumes, the fact that a tenth of the audience from the Tim and Eric Krimba special is sitting there looking miserable. It has this really sad quality to it that I find oddly sticking with me all this time later. It has this building sense of dread that from frame one begins at complete desperation and just gets worse from there. This is not starting well. I don't think I've ever had this much secondhand embarrassment for Tim Heidecker or Greg Turkington's characters, and that's saying a whole lot. There are so many moments in this that feel like trying to describe a bizarre stress dream I would have. Like, man, I had this weird nightmare. I was standing on a stage in a sad hotel ballroom. My name was written everywhere. There was this tiny audience of strange, confused, and sleepy people eating funnel cakes that had no idea where they were and what was happening. I was supposed to give this lecture, but I had no idea what I was talking about, so I started rambling nonsense about lithium and cryptocurrency and the sun, but the presentation didn't work, so I completely froze. I need to talk to somebody from IT. To make matters worse, my father, that band that did that song Ballroom Blitz, and my ex were all there judging me. Oh yeah, and Big Bird was there too for some reason. Or, I was using VHS tapes to publicly propose to a woman that barely knows me and wants nothing to do with me. She ran away, so I dressed up as Dumbledore and cried. To me, the real genius of On Cinema's latest disaster in San Bernardino County is in its own unique way conveying this specific feeling better than almost anything I've ever seen. There's such a strong vision here and it's executed really well, especially given it yet again raises the bar in terms of what can be achieved technically in an even more elaborate live production from a small and scrappy team of geniuses playing to an amazing fan base that gets to follow along while supporting it financially. I love this shit. My expectation going into this is that it would either be an explosive disaster that never gets off the ground like a fire fest of Amato heads, or a functionally legitimate event that's in every way a complete embarrassment. The joke, so to speak, being that either this event would be hilariously catastrophic or hilariously lame and misguided. Turns out it's largely the latter. That is, of course, until the last 15 minutes suddenly become an absolutely amazing example of the former, in probably the most chaotic and exciting finale yet. So why waste any time at all? Let's get into the big bombshell here, the twist that absolutely no one saw coming that left us all reeling. You see, on a recorded video from Germany, Hank explains that Chaplin's is taking their founder Tom Chaplin's belief system of great tasting food that's fast and friendly and bringing it to the international market. New Chaplin's partner Conrad Muller explains that with the investment and logistical support of there's a plan to open a new flagship restaurant in Berlin. It makes sense because Charlie Chaplin visited there, so the people of Berlin will warm to the new restaurant quicker than a pot of three bean three alarm chowder in a crock pot on the highest setting. This is an exciting new venture, complete with fusion delights such as Chaplin's Chili Worst, Oktoberfest, Harvest 
beer chili, chili spetzel, mac and cheese, and a six alarm chili pork schnitzel. I think I speak for all of us when I say I know we're all ready to forgive Hank for bringing chili popcorn last year on Greg's big night. Can you make some that doesn't have this chili powder? And we wish Hank and the gang the best in their exciting European expansion. It's what we've all been waiting for, and I think it's an understatement to say, it's about time. Anyways, now that that's out of the way, I guess we can talk about the rest of it. I said it's far from the funniest Oscar special. I don't think it was trying to be the funniest. I think the point of this is larger than that. One of the things that surprised me was how emotionally charged it all was. Maybe most notably with Greg of all people, but we'll get to that later. Even still, there's some truly hilarious stuff here. I mean, personally, the least funny Oscar special is still funnier to me than most things out there. For me, a lot of the funniest moments really belong to Greg in this one. Or G-Reg, as Tim hilariously calls him. G-Reg. G-Reg. Hey, guys. So it's a shame that he's sidelined for a lot of it. Well, there's no reason to cut to him. His ridiculous new coding system in which he adds letters to title numbers to signify prequels, requels, and sequels is so perfectly pompous and useless. Jaws 2 would be called Jaws 2S. That makes it easier for buffs to know exactly what they're going to see. His usual Oscar talk mumbo jumbo is so great as always. It's continually just my favorite comedic content there is. All 10 movies nominated for best picture were five bag of popcorn movies. Joe, they're doing the best song. That, that should be on the, the uh, Grammys, not on the Oscars. Basically this year it would be a 10 way tie for best picture. Oscar's not gonna do that, it's bad for the ratings. Personal highlights are him deciding that the winner for some reason will be picked based on how many previous winners have started with the same first letter and predicting that with the use of AI, characters will now be able to play other characters in other movies. The character of James Bond would play the uh, the character of Jack Sparrow. But honestly, a lot of the best purely comedic bits for me were all the pre-taped segments. They were firing on all cylinders in this department. I would legitimately watch eight hours of outtakes of these three as the pet boys and Tim abusing Mark. No! Stop it! Stop! It's absolutely one of the most absurd and silly things this show has offered us since Decker vs. Dracula, and I loved every minute of it. I love that since it's just being cut together from outtakes by Greg to resemble some kind of story, it's even more nonsensical than usual, and it includes so many double line reads and mistakes. Hey, uh, boys! Hold on, Joe. Yeah, we're about your car. Oh, there you go. I how's it going here? Yeah, about your car. Get yourself a cup of... Uh, coffee? Is that coffee? Plus, it was really nice to see Mark. I do miss him a lot anytime he's not involved with an Oscar special, and his absence is really felt here. I still don't quite understand what the update about him being dead was about. Mark Pork uh, was involved in a, an accident this afternoon. But it's pretty funny looking back on it now knowing that immediately afterwards a news article went out saying it was bad intel and he was fine. Was Tim just lying or was I missing something here? What are your thoughts on that joke? Another highlight was Vic Berger's amazing Robert De Niro edit. There's a real artistry that goes into these and I want a hundred more of them. It doesn't top the Pinocchio one from last year for me, especially given Pinocchio was presented as part of the story of the last Oscar special and this one was kind of dropped in during a break, but it's still amazing. What's up now, bro? Yeah, what's up now, bro? Plus, I do like the idea of there being pre-taped content to watch during the breaks, almost like commercials alongside the usual trivia questions. Speaking of, I think it may have been cut out of the cut down version, but the trivia card that made me laugh so hard was the one that asked something along the lines of what is the correct number of pillars to base your life on with a list of different numbers to choose from. It's such perfect self-help BS that means absolutely nothing to anyone. The one I found to be truly inspired is another one of those examples of a pitch perfect joke that just couldn't be found anywhere else. It has so many layers of absurdity. Just think about this, a man who mistakenly thinks that he he's found his soulmate because he met a woman that likes Harry Potter, which by the way, there are literally countless millions of all over the world. Brings an old can of cream of shrimp soup from a Ma and Pa Kettle movie that he bought with the budget for a Pep Boys baboon movie to Harry Potter world to sneak it into a gift shop and leave it on a shelf. Show me an SNL writer that can come up with a premise as bizarre as that and make it work. Greg Turkington is a goddamn genius with this kind of stuff, and I think even after all these years, this is one of the most shining examples of his joke construction at work. The fact that he literally says, hey Kylie at the beginning, hey Kylie, the image of him proudly holding a disgusting can of soup, and all the threads that went into justifying this that are hilarious in themselves. No one else can do this, and you get the distinct sense of watching something really original and refreshing when he lets loose. But his other half ain't too shabby either, and Tim comes in hot with a segment that in its own way showcases his brilliance as a comedian. These puppies really grip the road. The idea of his pathetic childlike obsession with getting this used 2018 Dodge Charger at the end of the weekend is funny on its own, but this segment that he made showing off the car was another one of my biggest laughs at a Motocon. He's better than anyone at this shtick of explaining and presenting these simple mundane things as if they're groundbreaking and impressive. You got one press 
start button here. You got this six speed automatic transmission, which just feels so natural to the touch. It reminds me of the kind of thing his character in Tim's Kitchen Tips does as he tries to make these simple dips and techniques for stirring and whatnot sound way more impressive than they are by over explaining them. What I'm doing is there's, I'm creating a, a, a millions of little air bubbles out in there and that's letting the water evaporate. Cut to him hyping up a USB 2.0 connection and how perfectly the glove box fits back into its slot after you open it. Real easy and it just latches in so nicely. Amazing. And the ride along with Giamato is one of the most awkward things I've seen in a long time. It's this strange snapshot of the father-son experience, but through the weirdest lens imaginable. Wow. I've said it before, but I'm continuously impressed by the performance of the actor who plays Giamato. How uncomfortable he looks in this car is priceless, and the way he says right on, son, makes me laugh every time. Right on, son. Right on. But okay, just this setup alone. Tim is adopted in middle age by a man who offers him a used 2018 Dodge Charger as a prize if he can successfully pull off organizing a three-day business conference in a hotel ballroom in Rialto. California. Crazy. Then, having seen the insane promises made about this incredibly elaborate theoretical event, it's starting as a complete letdown from what was advertised and going so poorly at every step of the way is such a perfect way to frame this special. Of course, we know he's going to fail. We know he's sadly not going to be getting that used 2018 Dodge Charger, and it's so fun to watch how exactly everything will go wrong, and how pitiful every molecule of this event will be. <coughs> Attendees were promised a keynote address that was said to be unmissable. Lithium is something that is all around us. In actuality, it's a nonsensical few minutes of cringy floundering that becomes an absolute meltdown, complete with ominous droning sci-fi music for some reason. I have the wrong, we have the wrong file on this. It reminded me of the music from that gloriously strange ending to the fifth special, which I loved as a little callback to one of my favorite moments that's kind of beyond explanation. <laughs> Attendees were promised the biggest names in a variety of fields. No shade to the amazing Joe Estevez, but him and the remaining members of the suite being the only ones there isn't exactly an all-star roster of A-list celebrities. Attendees were promised five-star dining. There's two crappy food trucks, one of which is a dessert truck. Basically, they're not taking uh, credit cards anymore, but we're going to just, they've got so much... Uh, just so many desserts left. I guess that's an improvement over Tim's previous event in San Bernardino, so maybe he's improving a little. But it's so funny in showing what a pitiful scam it is. I love the image of some poor fool expecting a conference where serious business moguls gather and eat fancy foods and cocktails, and then showing up and finding themselves eating nothing but funnel cakes and churros and cotton candy and watching a man talk about how bad scotch tastes when you already have mints in your mouth. I also love how it becomes like a crutch for Tim to call out the treats when things aren't going well or he feels uncomfortable. You guys enjoying the funnel cake? Who got the churros? We got tons of churros left. Churros, funnel cakes, cotton candy. Who's got the, um, who's got their funnel cake? I wish I could get some of that. <laughs> you guys, if you want to get some funnel cake, honestly, now's a good time. He keeps constantly coming back to it as if funnel cakes make up for everything else. Like, I know I just freaked out and smashed a videotape on stage, but hey, how about those tasty churros? And it's not just the ticket holders. The partners involved are having a terrible time as well. The miserable looking merch lady says she isn't selling anything. It hasn't sold because nobody's here. The insurance company rep just up and leaves. The gutter lady can't possibly have seen any increase in business from this. Even Joe, who is always and forever agreeable to a fault, is so upset by the conditions that he interrupts the event multiple times because he isn't getting anything out of it. Usually I do one of these things, I get a guarantee. Thousand dollars up front just to sit there and, and smile. I'm trying to whisper here and, and, and to sell a few pictures, you know, and just to, you don't pay for my gas getting down here. It's all part of this great overall joke that in this seminar celebrating wealth and prosperity and teaching us how to self-actualize and achieve our financial goals, the organizers are cheaping out at every level. My favorite little example is the idea that the shitty Amatocon swag is not even free, but being sold at a discount. We're not giving these away, but we're deep discounting these guys. These are uh, really nice. I think they're Ray-Bans or this Ray-Ban style sunglasses. Or in the wind tunnel segment. They rented this ridiculous machine for one lame segment that amounts to absolutely nothing. And Tim is being so cheap that he's even concerned with how many bills the contestant grabbed and decides he's going to cap how many he can redeem. There's a, you know, probably there's a limit on that. I don't think you, you can take that much. To... It's absurd, especially given the fact that it's all in the form of a fake cryptocurrency for which no value has ever been set even after all this time. Plus the idea that this guy would have to sit there and scan QR codes on all these bills to get this useless payout. It's such a great joke and further shows how pointless all this is. Like, what is this event even supposed to be if that's the way it's being treated? What is this event supposed to be in general if this is the lineup of segments that was planned? It's so obvious that this is, as always, all about Tim and his ego and whatever he wants to present, and not about helping anyone else or making good on promises to paying customers. He pretends until the very last moments that this is all relevant and legit. It's been a great 
weekend. But from the beginning, he's honest about the fact that his real intentions here are to get a 2018 Dodge Charger. Dodge Charger. That is the, what it's all about. I love how he frames this as an inspiring lesson about the power of reward, but in reality, it's completely irrelevant. No one else gets offered cars by their adopted fathers to put on good business conferences. We can apply this to everybody. It's all such a hilariously thin veneer. How in God's name could you argue that a reunion of an on-cinema, on-demand, encore show where the topic of conversation is all about going to a movie theater with a VR headset on and a canceled movie about the Pet Boys fighting a baboon would be useful to someone looking to self-actualize in the business world? Because again, that's what this was supposed to be. I like to watch the special imagining I'm a small business owner and attending this business conference to learn about the useful skills that were advertised. I don't know anything about the personal dynamics of those involved, so I don't need to hear inside baseball about rating conversion or other personal dramas. I don't understand why there's a guy who keeps arguing that they should be talking about the Oscars. I don't understand why there are two Italian musicians negotiating their visas, and a third guy along with them who doesn't seem to do literally anything at all. Again, I don't understand why the MC is framing this whole thing as a way for him to get a used 2018 Dodge Charger from his dad. I don't understand why any of this is happening or why I'm here. A dysfunctional lack of purpose has always been a feature of the Oscar special tradition, but this year it's taken to a whole new level, because now not only is it a useless Oscar commentary show, but somehow even more useless as a business convention. Plus, there's a note that's unique to this Oscar special because of the addition of a live audience in the room with the gang. I mentioned before that the atmosphere is the area in which this special excels the most, and the audience is such an important part of this. It's just such a perfectly cast group of people, and they all look so confused and bored the whole time. It's another element that goes along with the classic picture overlays that can be used to punctuate jokes. Like when something hilarious or cringe happens, a well-timed cut to a sad woman eating a funnel cake can take it over the edge. The presence of these people adds this extra element of pressure as Tim and Greg and everyone else now not only have the people watching at home, but spectators right there in the room with them. It makes the awkward moments and embarrassments feel that much more immediate and personal, and I have to imagine it would somewhat feel like that for Tim and Greg in real life performing this too. Because for the first time in an Oscar special taping, real Tim and Greg have people sitting there who don't actually know the universe watching them perform. And it's interesting to think how that might shape their performances. Some of you in the comments have referred me to the On The Funny podcast, and they just did a fantastic interview with Eddie Alfano, who plays Joey Patron, and he said he heard audience members of the taping talking about how they didn't understand it at all and didn't think it was funny. I just love that idea so much because on top of in-universe cringe, it adds this layer of real-world cringe to the whole thing as well. Anyway, go listen to the On The Funny podcast if you haven't. Those guys are awesome. The other stylistic aspect that I really love is the music. It's absolutely fantastic and pitch perfect in accompanying this madness. And there's a lot of it. Winning. Taking the court straight, ascending. We winning. Music has always been a big part of the Oscar specials. It's, it's really quite hard to top the two Oscar medleys in terms of how the Oscar specials use music, or the Thanes of the Shire being ousted for the greatest live cover of Bohemian Rhapsody of all time, or the downright poetic use of Empty Bottle 2.0 as everyone's dying of poison, hearkening back to what you can imagine imagine being a similar scene set to the same song at the Electric Sun Music Festival. But this special is another example. Of course, first we have the opening rap along to my new favorite song of all time, It's the Knockout. It's a model con, all the blood, sweat, and tears. In which Giamato is the undisputed star. I mean, look at this. What is this? I can't take my eyes off it. The generic hype music that's played throughout is so perfectly overstating the importance of all of this. It's a great source of humor when contrasted with how lame or out of place the action is. <laughs> my absolute favorite example of this is when Tony comes out after the intro about the death of her son for a somber chat about it, and her music cue sounds like this. Let's give her some love, okay? This is somebody who needs a lot of love. Such a perfect joke and weirdly one of my biggest laughs in this whole thing. I think because it really perfectly represents the core disconnect between what an event like this wants to be and whatever the hell is happening here. I'm not sure if it's meant to represent anything when the switch happens. I really can't find a thematic reason for it, but I did really love when the music for the breaks switched back to the classic Oscar music. <laughs> Love me some Tinseltown Christmas nostalgia. Beyond that, we get another self-interested, egocentric performance weakly pretending to be a heartfelt tribute to another one of Tim's sons that have passed because of him. When this started up, I half expected him to sing the lyrics, Goodbye Matt Newman, I miss you son, you ain't coming back. But I love the lyrics being bang bang and prominently evoking the violence of what happened as if that's not an incredibly insensitive and inappropriate way to go about this. Especially because he basically just starts bad-mouthing Matt to his mother right after the song. I mean, this is a 25-year-old, 24-year-old kid, however old he was, living at home still. You can't just uh, be a child forever. You, there's a time where you gotta grow up. The big one here is a Motocon idol. 
It was actually one of the parts of this that left me feeling a little bit disappointed because the big Dakar drama buildup kind of dissolved immediately in a way that felt a bit anticlimactic to me. That being said, I loved seeing the dueling empty bottle performances, a song that is the comedic gift that just keeps on giving. Plus the fact that Corwin literally sits there doing absolutely nothing during Axe and Manuel's performance made me laugh pretty hard. It's like his only purpose there is to piss off Tim. And I did feel bad for him that not only did he lose his own band, but he didn't get to become the next Amato Khan Idol. I wanted to be the next American Idol. Thanks. But the empty bottle players, my god, this was a highlight for me. Hat aside, the idea that Tim spares no expense to get many of these amazingly talented session musicians to make sure that he beats Axiom and Manuel is so funny. Of course he would do that. That's where the money for the five-star dining went, I guess. And this new version of Empty Bottle is an absolute treat. I'll admit I was getting down to this one. It's being played technically far better than ever, but somehow remaining still such an embarrassing performance for Tim, especially as he gets subtly pissed with the guitarists when they're upstaging him during the solo. But my absolute favorite piece of music in this whole thing is the bit in the whole of On Cinema that comes the closest to feeling like an episode of Tim and Eric's Bedtime Stories or something. The Power of Mercy was something I was really curious about leading into this. Giamato is a fascinating character to me and his lines about mercy in the trailer are so ominous and strange. Beside being hilarious that his big speech ends up being nothing but a reading from Merchant of Venice and a song, it's actually really haunting and disturbing. We're watching this sinister old man singing about being evil and repenting and sin, and it feels sincere. Almost like this man is afraid of himself. It's such a fascinating scene and I couldn't look away. The performance here is crazy. It's so unique. The mannerisms, the voice, what he's doing with his eyes and his body language. It's all simultaneously scary and kind of sad. And the best part is that it goes on for so long. While the always perfect instincts of Eric Naturnicola's direction take us around the room to the perfect reactions at the perfect times. Patient now, wash me, make me pure. I think without being particularly funny in itself, it's one of the strangest notes this entire universe has ever hit, and I love it. I keep rewatching to try to make sense of what I'm seeing, and I can't really. But oddly, if I wasn't sure that Giamato was responsible for Matt's death before this, it somehow confirmed it for me without spelling it out at all. Which brings me to the real meat of this thing, the ever-apparent grime in the pipes of the Amato organization. The special ends with Tim losing his temper, snitching on G for orchestrating Matt Newman's murder, and Tim and Greg getting beat up by Joey outside the hotel. That escalated quickly. This is absolutely my second favorite ending to an Oscar special ever. Second only to the obvious one. But man, this was crazy. The lead up in G's weirdly terrifying Power of Mercy song, G telling Tim that he failed. You have uh, failed. There must be consequences for your deeds. <laughs> no, I... In fact, there must be punishment. The argument in the wings, the fight, and the fact that the empty bottle players are jamming on upbeat music while Tim is bleeding and screaming and Big Bird is walking around, and the way G slides around at the end is so unsettling. Even in a moment like this, he remains so mysterious and unreadable. I love how they built up to this crescendo. In the final third of this special, it just feels like everything has been falling apart for two hours. Tony is drinking again, Greg is broken inside and humiliated, Joey and Tim are on very, very bad terms, and it's crystal clear that the event has been a massive failure. So when Tim brought up the power of reward again, I knew what was going to happen. It's absolute chaos, but it feels earned. Like everything has inevitably been leading to a confrontation like this. But the interesting thing is that all it took for everything to crumble down, for Tim to risk his own life to implicate the Amatos in this murder, was to be told that he wasn't getting a 2018 Dodge Charger. A childish tantrum, sure, but maybe more than that. I think knowing what happened was weighing on Tim, forcing him to reconsider his place among the Amatos in his own circle. Mostly all we got from Tim leading up to this special was propaganda about how great his dad and the Amato group were. But even beforehand, you could see the cracks beginning to show. From the hostility between Tim and G in the penultimate episode of the season, to the high news update before the event in which Tim claims G was screaming at him about his facial hair, saying, it is unknown why dad was so furious, and to quote him, nauseous over my facial hair. He was like I've never seen him before, extremely upset. Dad is a kind and merciful man but he was screaming over this, and it felt like the only way to stop him from reacting so dramatically was to just suck it up and shave the goatee. It was clear from this that there is a real dark side of G that we haven't seen, and that not all is well in his relationship with Tim, which a lot of us have theorized about extensively. The situation our characters are in has itself been a mystery. How do Tim and Greg fit into this organization? What do these people want with them? Because at every juncture, the Amatos have seemingly been supportive of their lives in the show, which is why it was so fascinating to watch the curtains pull back a bit over the course of the Oscar special, without overtly explaining what was going on. First off with Joe Joey and Tim. It's clear their dynamic has shifted drastically. While Joey seems to want to remain professional, Tim is clearly uninterested in playing nice, and it's obvious he's antagonizing Joey the whole time. This is Joey. He's just, everything's fine. Everything's perfect. So he should be a rageaholic like you? I think the moment where Tim first calls him Joey Patron is where it becomes really clear, and this little moment was so well executed and says so much about how they feel about each other. Don't, don't call me Joey Patron again, okay? Nobody calls me that, and especially not you. 
All right. I wonder if there's a reason he's so suddenly averse to this nickname, but I think it's simply meant to demonstrate Joey's distaste for Tim. As in, only my friends call me that, and you are not my friend. This is the good stuff, Joey. Just remember this? <laughs> From high school? It's unclear what caused the shift, but this whole special in the abstract feels like Tim's internal struggle between the two groups in his life, representing him weighing the cons of both his OG on cinema crew and this new crime family he's involved with. The two groups are pulling at him constantly, and it feels like he's fighting all of it. More than ever, it feels like he's really alone up there, with his only genuine interest being getting his hands on a 2018 Dodge Charger. <laughs> we push for reward. The way I see it is this. Tim knows that G ordered someone to go over and shake down Tony, and this resulted in Matt's death. I didn't ask for that. I asked you for you, some help. He's both afraid and still desperately wants to fit in with this family, to have a father, so he keeps his mouth shut. But through all this, something unlikely happened. He reconnected with Tony, who had broken his heart and initially sent him on this path toward G. This was pulling him away from the Amatos for the first time, hence the sudden change in attitude towards Joey and G. It feels like a big part of him wanted the Amatos to get caught, hence his continuous circulation of the video of the shooter. But he still wasn't coming forward with it all the way into a con, continuing to throw out red herrings, like it is entirely performative live investigation, where the kid on the phone suggests that Matt's killer could be his weird stepdad, which was hilarious. He might have been his weird stepdad. He was kind of into some weird no, stuff. No, I don't, that's, you're talking the wrong, you're, Thank you very much. But there was one final straw that pushed him all the way back to Team Tony. All it took was not getting that 2018 Dodge Charger to send him over the edge and rip him from the Amato spell entirely. This is exactly what G wanted to avoid, hence telling Tim that he wasn't allowed to speak to Tony. I told you not to talk with her. As for Joey, we still don't know his exact involvement with Matt Newman's murder, and I think neither does Tim. Right, folks? I do a show every day or every week. And he's the co-host of the show, and suddenly he's gone. Pressing him about disappearing afterwards suggests that he's at least suspicious that Joey may be the shooter. I love the way this animosity builds throughout and sets up Tim's beating at the end so that it has much more personal weight behind it. The reveal that Joey and Kylie are together caught me by surprise. But it's especially interesting because it raises the question, why did this need to be a secret? It doesn't seem to be a new development, given they were in Mexico together as revealed by the photo on the phone. Could it have something to do with Greg? There have been moments where the Kylie and Greg situation has felt like a honeypot of sorts. But I still have absolutely no clue what purpose that would serve beyond keeping Greg's attention fixed in the direction of their choosing. Either way, it leads to one of the most surprising things I could have imagined happening in On Cinema. Greg proposing to a woman. First off, this is hilarious and so fitting that in Greg's mind, the best way to propose would be to hype up a segment as he always does. If they have an Oscar for segments on the On Cinema Oscar special, this would win it. And then use the titles of VHS tapes to get the point across. But it's also heartbreakingly sad and pathetic. I think it's easily Greg's most humiliating moment ever, and I almost wanted to turn away many times. This guy who's presumably never had a love interest in his life or anyone interested in him, whose only love is movies, is rejected live on the internet in the most embarrassing way possible possible. The image of him on the verge of tears retreating back to his only love, his VHS tapes, has an emotional depth to it that we don't usually get with the Greg character. Tim, on the other hand, has always been an emotional mess who wears his heart on his sleeve and is constantly showing us these sides of him. But Greg is so much more buttoned up and mysterious in that sense. So to see him so deflated and depressed and emotional like this is really interesting to watch. I love these moments in On Cinema where something so overflowing with emotion is undercut by the fact that, for example, Greg is dressed up in a ridiculous Dumbledore costume looking defeated. Dumbled Dumbledore is the wizard from one of the wizards from Harry Potter, and it was played by uh, two actors that passed away, so now I'm the third Dumbledore. The situation is really sad and icky, but it's this contrast between the fun and levity of what was planned and how things ended up in reality that really makes me laugh. This leads to yet another moment that I found really special. When Tim is getting the shit kicked out of him by Joey, Greg runs out to help him and he gets himself thrown down to the ground. After all Tim put him through, he still ran out there to help. I thought this was amazing. This image of these two men that have been fighting with each other for so many years, both played and scorned by the same family, having lost their fathers and love interests in a matter of minutes. Here they are lying bruised and betrayed in the bushes, together. This is a perfect representation of the cycle of the show and the nature of these characters. No matter what happens, they'll always end up here. And that's why they're eternally linked, whether that's a good thing or not. But again, though so much of this came to a head, there wasn't that much in the way of revealing the intentions that have been so obscured. In terms of the why of it all, there's really only one interesting new development the doubt that's cast on G's mental state. There are a ton of little references throughout to suggest that G may be losing it a bit. It first came up in my mind when the film Joey Reviewed mentions this. When a contract killer has a rapidly evolving form of dementia, it planted the seed in my mind to look for more clues. And sure enough, here and there, there are references to his cognitive decline. References to how he forgets things. Well, he, he forgets sometimes. His hilariously confused rejection of Tim's Big Bird gift. Why? I, I don't like this bird even though he's talked about Big Bird in the past. He made a big deal about the Big Bird on the show. The Big Bird. And the way Joey has to stop him from paying $6,000 for an unverified movie prop. 
I'm not entirely certain this is the case, but I love the idea that this man that we've been following so warily, sometimes fearing, is really an aging crime boss with dementia. Maybe in this case, a lot of the mysterious behavior we've witnessed could be linked to senility, and not to careful planning or puppet master string pulling. Maybe he insisted Greg remain a part of On Cinema simply because he's losing his grip on reality and he likes his ideas. There has to be more to it than this, and he certainly isn't so far gone that it could explain away everything, but I think it's a really fascinating angle for us to keep our eyes on going forward with whatever happens. Speaking of, what the hell is going to happen? Going into this, I noted that there were more open threads and unanswered questions than ever. Season 14 was packed full of intrigue. Its biggest surprise is that it ended up presenting a really compelling mystery, laying out mysterious character motivations and unexplained events that I hoped would come to a head at a Motocon. And they kind of didn't. But they also kind of did. What do we know now? Well, not a whole lot that we didn't know before. We know that Scotch is from Scotland. We know Tim went to G and asked him for help when he heard Tony was talking to the DA, and then Matt Newman ended up dead shortly after. So clearly the Amados ordered a hit that went wrong, right? Well, maybe not. On the recent wrap-up Q&A on the High Network, it was teased that in the coming months we'll get more answers and developments in the story. We got a really funny, albeit short, live stream in which Tim talks about how he has the smoking gun evidence that will incriminate the Amados. This uh, murder, devious murder plot was discussed and coordinated with the entire Amato group uh, uh, without my involvement or knowledge, we're going to be providing uh, all the evidence that the district attorney will need to have him, uh, to have the entire Amato group arrested and prosecuted for the death of my son, Matt Newman. Shame on them. And you will be able to access this documentation publicly on the High Network as soon as we can make it available in digital form. The file was corrupted on the site, which was a great joke on its own. I'm not entirely certain this is real, but someone on Reddit was able to repair the file and get it open, revealing the flimsiest evidence imaginable, including pretty much only stills from the show and Amato Con that we've already seen repeated over and over and over again. I love the fact that they do stuff like that. It's so fun to be a fan of this show and the creators allow you to play along like this and reward you with extra jokes and tidbits for investigating further. Actually a great metaphor for the humor model of this show in general, but it suggests that Tim doesn't actually know anything. He just wants to bluff that he has evidence, purposefully corrupting the file so nobody can prove him wrong. And the reason for this may be, in fact, that there isn't anything for him to know in the first place. Recently, the High Network aired the District Attorney of San Bernardino press conference regarding the Matt Newman investigation. It threw us yet another huge curveball in this story, seemingly providing some definitive answers about Matt's death, but in the process only raising more about the involvement of Tim, the Amatos, and the events at AmatoCon. And honestly, I'm kind of lost. It seems like we're getting more new questions than actual answers at this point. This release suggests that as far as the DA is concerned, Matt was extorting high school girls for high points, I mean Bitcoin, and was killed by a third party protecting one of the girls. I found this interesting reflecting on how adamant Tony was that the police should not be allowed to access their computers. I wonder if she knew something. They want Matt's computer. I'm not handing it over to them. Anyway, a man named Joaquin Gabriel Neville was taken into custody for this under the belief that no one else was involved in the crime. If true, this is a huge twist against all of our theories, and I'm not sure I believe it. Like, really? It's just totally unrelated to all of this? I suppose it could be pretty funny in the case that this whole thing was a misunderstanding, that Tim thought the Amatos were responsible when they in fact had nothing to do with it and soured his relationship with them for no reason at all. Amato could be done. But it would certainly be unsatisfying, and I don't think that's the case. When the gunman came to the door, he was asking for Tony. Because he said something about, is Tony home? That doesn't line up with the idea that he was there to take out Matt. Could it indeed be possible that the Amatos covered their asses by cooking up this story to frame this other guy? Otherwise, I'm not sure how to square this development with everything else we've seen. Or was G just really a nice guy taking interest in Tim all along? At the end, when Tim is freaking out, G comes over to him seemingly trying to help, like he really cares about him. Maybe it's the senility thing, but it still just feels like there's so much about this guy's motives that I can't put my finger on at all. Let me know your theories on this, but it certainly seems like the Amato saga is far from over. They've set it up so there's a lot of directions it could go. An investigative series with Lucas Gibson Brown and LaRue, perhaps? A season in witness protection where Tim just can't help himself but give himself away by returning to the spotlight? Or dare I say it, another trial. I love the idea that once again Tim is becoming involved with the legal officials of San Bernardino County in some way. Wherever it goes, it'll be really fun to see how these characters adapt to their new circumstances. One of the reasons I'm so particularly fond of season 10 of On Cinema is how they play with the fallout of the trial. The legal complications, the fight for control of the show, the moral issues that come up, the way these characters are dealing with the aftermath of such a traumatic experience, and the comforts that they find and the distractions that they create for themselves, moving on in ways that are so uniquely them. It's all really rich storytelling and just so damn funny. I think in the wake of AmatoCon, they've set themselves up in a similar way because the event was so awful for literally every single person involved, and the ripple effects from what happened here can be huge. Greg had his heart broken publicly in his most vulnerable moment. Tim lost the new family he was putting so much of himself into, and by snitching on them made himself a likely target for violent retaliation. The Amatos will likely be facing a criminal 
criminal investigation of some kind. Joe lost his last photo of Bobby Z. I don't know who that is, but... Tony not only lost her son, but fell off the wagon after finally getting sober and breaking free from her toxic relationship with Tim. This was a particularly sad moment for me, and it was just a quick blinker you miss it detail that has enormous implications for her character. I can only imagine that this second run at romance with Tim now that she's drinking again will only end even worse than before. Said it a thousand times, but the character building and their dynamics are really what is so unparalleled. It's such a feat when you think about it that in this silly, absurd universe where a movie called Pet Boys, A Baboon Story is allowed to exist, there can be something as overflowing with tension and emotion as this, especially the last half hour of this special. Observing the dynamics between all these characters, taking into account everything we know as well as everything we don't, is as riveting to me here as any serious TV drama. And a lot of this has to do with Tim's character. It's so much deeper than your average silly, bombastic, overconfident buffoon in a comedy movie or show. There's a real helpless sadness to it. At the end of this special, when Tim is bloody and crying on the floor, I took note of the fact that I kind of felt bad for him. But I questioned why. Because essentially we're following a villain of sorts as our protagonist in this show. Most recently, it certainly seems like he was involved in the murder of Matt Newman. At the very least, in trying to scare Tony away from squealing on his past murders, he is easily one of the least sympathetic and wholly unredeemable main characters I can think of. In that sense, it kind of reminds me of Breaking Bad, maybe the best example of being invested in following a monster as a protagonist. Actually, the two shows have more in common than you might think. Spoilers for a show that ended 12 years ago, but both shows follow a person for which a life-threatening diagnosis from a doctor sets them on a path of crime and corruption in an unlikely partnership that causes pain and suffering for everyone involved. In Breaking Bad, we root for Walter White not because he's doing the right thing, definitely not because we want his annoying wife to get the money, but because in oversimplified terms, what we're really rooting for is the amazing story and complex character to evolve as far as it can before he gets caught. There's an element of that in On Cinema too. We want Tim to keep causing chaos and destruction and being toxic simply because it's hilarious and entertaining. We don't want him to get better. We don't want him to be arrested or any equivalent, because then all that would remain is this. It is the top 10 Humphrey Bogart roles of all time. So which I would still watch until the end of time. But still, just like Walter, if Tim gets stopped or killed or changes his ways, then our exciting, challenging journey with him is over. But when Walter's lying there dead on the floor of a meth lab and that journey really is over, we don't necessarily feel sad for his death, only pity for those he hurt or corrupted. I'm not sure that this would be the same in Tim's case. He's so stupid and out of control and tortured that there's moments here and there where you can actually really feel bad for him or sad for his clear torment. On paper, Tim may even seem to be a worse person in some ways. Walter attempted to poison one kid, Tim successfully poisoned many, many kids. Walter let a sick person die when he could have saved her. Tim did this with his own infant son. But while Walter is a cold, calculating genius that in almost every case acted with intention, Tim is a helpless, confused, thirsty fool. He's simply one of the most damaged souls ever put to screen, and he's constantly, every step of the way, made to look like an idiot and is himself further hurt in some way. Such a clueless man always desperately trying to present himself as some kind of role model or thought leader, and the fallout from this always being taken to the absolute worst possible scenario is just the ultimate goldmine for humor in this universe. But in almost equal measure, it's also really sad when you stop to think about any of it. This combo is what makes On Cinema so rare, and what makes this character, in my opinion, one of the best ever created. Amadokan taps into this in such a big way, and it's part of what makes it so important. Tim's behavior is closely linked to his longing for the father figure that he never had. In continuing with the Pinocchio metaphor set up in the previous Oscar special, he's basically a hollow shell, still in his adult years, longing to become a real boy. Do I look like a real boy, Papa? He thinks this new identity is the ticket, that this strange man becoming his father will finally make him happy and complete. When it all falls apart at the end of this special, it makes such a huge impact because of how clear the stakes of this relationship and Tim's internal struggle are. So if Breaking Bad is a show about a regular guy finding his true self in the vicious criminal he was always meant to be and causing destruction in his wake, On Cinema is a show about a silly man searching everywhere he can to find his true self, but never ever can. Not even in the criminal his adopted father wants him to become. Oh yeah, and no matter what causes a trail of destruction in his wake. Tim remains hopelessly lost, and that's both what makes it so sad, and by contrast, what makes this... We are the Pet Boys. Car uh, repairs are our area of expertise. So funny. If this series did end with Tim, just like Walter, dead in the place where his dark path began, likely an on-fire movie theater in Victorville with the smell of Stouffer's chicken and store-bought truffle popcorn going up in flames, I think we'd be sad for the fact that he never figured himself out, that he never felt happier at peace, and that he never got help. That's a hell of a thing to be able to say about a show that, again, brought us this. We head to the baboon jungle, the three of us. How could, how hard could it be to take some treasure from a couple of baboons? Baboons. 
They're no match for the pet boys. Also, Breaking Bad had no baboons. If you didn't click away, thank you for enduring my random comparison that nobody asked for. I know that was self-indulgent, but hey, this whole thing is. I could be way off in this assessment, so I'd love to hear your opinions, but based on the comments I've seen, I think this may be the most polarizing Oscar special yet, with many people, myself mostly included, absolutely loving it, and some feeling a little let down. It makes sense why this would be the case. It's easily the most different of all of them, at least of the on-cinema Oscar specials. It's so different that it's almost not really fair to compare this to the others in the same way. It was so geared toward the dynamics of the Amato group and these big plot points that the core dynamic of Tim and Greg and the usual Oscar festivities may have suffered for it a bit. It being an Oscar special and all, it'll inevitably draw those comparisons. Because this was be advertised doing... as an Oscar special. But theoretically, if Amatocon had been a standalone event in the vein of the Wendy Kirby Valentine's Day special on the High Network, I think it would be pretty universally loved as a piece of this universe. I love the idea that in that case, Tim and Greg could have put out a simple, low-budget Oscar special in its wake in the style of the first one. But I know that's being greedy. I think some kind of a return to the less elaborate days of On Cinema could be a really cool direction for them to go in next that would work perfectly with the story that they've set up as they deal with the fallout from all of this and no longer having funding from G. Four grand. They'll get me the mics. Wherever it goes, this was awesome, and I truly can't wait to see what happens next. I'll try my best to make more videos about whatever comes up in a more timely manner now that I've sold all the businesses that I started after Amatocon.